Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to cover the long-term carbon cycle. Organic and inorganic processes are important to the long-term carbon cycle, and we are going to discuss both. Let's get started. This is a slide showing the reservoirs of carbon on Earth. The takeaways from this figure on the right that are relevant to this lecture are that there are vast amounts of carbon in rocks. This is in the form of organic carbon and inorganic carbon, which is mostly limestone, also known as chalk or calcium carbonate. Also, that a very tiny portion of this carbon is considered economically usable fossil fuels. And you should remember that the short-term organic carbon cycle, which we covered in a different lecture, is the cycling of carbon through the biosphere via photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, and respiration or decomposition. And so the short-term carbon cycle deals with fluxes in and out of living biomass. We're going to start the long-term carbon cycle off by talking about the organic component. Here is a box model showing the carbon cycle on Earth. The long-term organic carbon cycle actually involves a leak in the short-term carbon cycle. This leak has to do with the lithosphere and the hydrosphere. Here is a breakdown of that leak. The quick cycling of carbon through the biosphere is almost a closed loop but a tiny amount of organic carbon leaks out of this loop by getting buried and trapped in marine sediments or on land and eventually becomes part of sedimentary rock. 10 million gigatons of organic carbon is stored in Earth's sedimentary rocks. The residence time is an average of 200 million years for this reservoir, versus the residence time of carbon in the atmosphere and in living things is around a decade. So to reiterate, the leak is the sedimentation and burial of organic matter, which is the inflow of organic carbon into, sedimentary, into the sedimentary rock reservoir. This organic matter can remain as buried organic carbon. Some can form fossil fuels while some is caught up in cratons, which are very old rocks on continents, or it can be subducted at convergent plate boundaries. This leak has been operating slowly for millions of years with a net effect of storing a huge amount of carbon in rocks. Carbon is reintroduced to the atmosphere by weathering, which is the destruction of rocks, and via volcanic activity. Let's talk about weathering now. Weathering is the disintegration or alteration of rock at or near the Earth's surface through physical, chemical, and or biological processes. Physical processes include heating and cooling, water, wind, and expansion. These, all these things can break down rock. Chemical processes include substances in the air and rain, like acid rain, that break down rock. And biological processes include plants and animals. Think of a root breaking through a rock or an animal burrowing into it. Plate tectonics is really important for cycling and exposing rocks to the surface. Back to the leak in the short-term carbon cycle. The weathering of organic carbon from rocks is just the slow outflow of organic carbon from the rock reservoir. So it undoes the leak, but only for sediments that were buried and are still organic. So it doesn't apply to subducted organic carbon since that becomes chemically altered when it is melted in the Earth's mantle. The slow decomposition of organic carbon in rocks exposed to the surface in the presence of oxygen, also known as oxidation, is the same reaction as respiration. We've mentioned fossil fuels, so let's define them now and how they fit into the long and now also the short carbon cycles. Fossil fuels are just stored organic carbon. It is stored in sedimentary rocks. When organic matter is buried and subjected to heat and pressure for a long enough period of time, the organic matter will turn into either coal or oil and gas. I have cartoon strips that show the processes for coal formation and oil and natural gas formation. While the mechanism is the same, heat, pressure, and time, the location and sources are different. Coal was formed when plant matter was buried in swamps, while oil and natural gas were formed when marine algae and animals died and were buried at the bottom of the ocean. Chemically, fossil fuels are still organic carbon. They are hydrocarbons rich in chemical energy, but they are very different from the original type of organic carbon that was buried. These processes can still occur, but fossil fuels are not a renewable resource for us because they take so long, millions of years, to form. So what we dig up and burn is gone forever on timescales relevant to us, and we reintroduce that carbon back into the atmosphere. Fossil fuels represent ancient solar energy stored as organic matter. They're like a planetary battery that was charged over millions of years ago by the sun. 
But humans are now using that battery up very quickly. Because remember, these fossil fuels take millions of years to form. Fossil fuels also release CO2 to the atmosphere when burned, which is exactly what we do with them. By burning coal, oil, and natural gas, we accelerate the release of vast amounts of carbon, carbon that took millions of years to accumulate, into the atmosphere every year. So we move the carbon from the slow carbon cycle to the fast carbon cycle. The upper graph is showing atmospheric CO2 concentration over time, while the lower graph is showing emissions. Now emissions decrease slightly during events like global financial crises or pandemics, but the overall atmospheric concentration does not go down except for the seasonal cycle that humans don't cause. So we just talked about the long-term organic carbon cycle, now let's talk about the long-term inorganic carbon cycle, which is also known as the carbonate silicate cycle. This cycle acts as a planetary thermostat. And in order to understand it, you need to be familiar with the inorganic forms of carbon on the planet, which are carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere or dissolved in seawater. Now in the ocean, there are actually several different forms uh, of inorganic carbon that's controlled by carbonate chemistry and pH. And then calcium carbonate as well, also known as limestone or chalk in sediments and rocks. Limestone in sedimentary rocks is actually a huge reservoir. You can see that on the pyramid to the right. The flows between these inorganic reservoirs proceed without light, which means they consist of purely physical and chemical processes only. The first process that comes into play with the inorganic carbon cycle is air-sea gas exchange. This actually happens very quickly, but affects the slow inorganic carbon cycle, so we gotta discuss it. All this means is that the atmosphere and the ocean exchange gases until they are in equilibrium with one another. They do this for all gases. Factors that affect the amount of gas water can hold includes temperature, the colder the water, the more gas water can hold, salinity, the less dissolved solutes, the more gas water can hold, and pressure, the higher the pressure, the more gas dissolves in water. Most gases are in equilibrium between a water body and the overlying atmosphere, but because carbon dioxide and oxygen are involved in biological processes, they can actually become undersaturated or supersaturated because organic organisms are constantly using up those gases or producing them. If water is undersaturated, more gas will dissolve into the water, and if water is supersaturated, outgassing will occur. Another factor that we have to discuss that affects how the slow carbon cycle is Another factor that we have to discuss that affects the slow carbon cycle is carbonate chemistry, which is affected by pH and atmospheric concentrations of CO2. First, some background on pH. pH is the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions, also known as protons, in solution. pH occurs on a scale of 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral. A high pH means that the number of protons is low and the solution is basic while a low pH means that the number of protons in a solution is high and the solution is acidic. The average pH of the ocean is 8.1, so it's slightly basic. Of course, the pH of the ocean varies with depth and many other factors, but it doesn't ever get super acidic or super basic. Remember that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dissolves in the ocean according to its equilibrium. Once that CO2 dissolves in the ocean, it enters a cascade of chemical reactions called the carbonate system or carbonate chemistry. That is visualized with these two images. The one on the far right shows CO2 dissolving in the water, at which point it will either form carbonic acid, bicarbonate, or carbonate. What form is dominant will depend on the pH. That is shown well in the image on the left. Increasing atmospheric CO2 lowers pH because if you're loading in CO2, which reacts with water molecules, of which there's no shortage in the ocean, it eventually forms carbonate and protons. Those protons lower the pH, making it more acidic. But the dominant form of carbonate shifts to bicarbonate because for every molecule of carbonate that's made, two protons are made. So one proton forms a molecule with carbonate and bicarbonate becomes the top or dominant chemical form. Having less carbonate ions available because they're all now bicarbonate, makes it very difficult for organisms that make calcium carbonate shells or skeletons. So higher CO2 in the atmosphere reduces the availability of a key ingredient in shells in the ocean. And if conditions get extremely acidic, 
than existing calcium carbonate shells and corals, which have calcium carbonate skeletons, will actually dissolve as well. So now that we've learned about carbonate, let's talk about the carbonate silicate cycle, which is the long-term inorganic method of maintaining CO2 balance for the Earth system. The carbonate silicate cycle consists of silicate weathering and volcanism. Silicate weathering consumes atmospheric CO2, while volcanism returns CO2 to the atmosphere. The carbonate silicate cycle is an important negative climate feedback and can operate without any life on Earth. Here is a helpful diagram that shows the carbonate silicate cycle. You can see that carbonate is being cycled between the atmosphere and rocks. Now, this negative feedback system absolutely needs plate tectonics and water on the surface to operate, so it wouldn't have been in place during early Earth before the planet had layers that were sorted according to density and before it had liquid water. But it's very much important today. It is also important on timescales greater than 100,000 years, so it isn't going to balance CO2 during our lifetimes. Like I said, the source of atmospheric CO2 is volcanic activity, and the sink for atmospheric CO2 consists of a series of steps. The first is that calcium silicate minerals are weathered from rocks and dissolve in rivers. Now, calcium silicate mineral weathering is similar to the weathering of organic carbon that we talked about earlier in the lecture, but the end result is different, and I'll tell you why now. So these calcium silicate minerals are weathered from rocks and dissolve in rivers. Atmospheric CO2 is important for the weathering of silicate minerals. The image on the left shows that really well. This makes calcium ions, bicarbonate, and silicon dioxide, also known as silicate, which is taken to the ocean where it can precipitate back, primarily as calcium carbonate, to solid forms and sink. So the weathering of calcium silicate minerals, rather than adding to CO2 in the atmosphere, as happened with organic carbon, the weathering of organic carbon, the weathering of calcium silicate removes CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, we also know that calcium carbonate and silica, as well, are major components of shells, which organisms may use and then sink after they die, but these compounds also form on their own and will occur in the absence of life. At the bottom of the ocean, the silica and calcium carbonate will eventually be subducted, or they could be put into cratons as well. The calcium silicate mineral that is the example of the parent rock that it's being weathered in the image on the left is called elastinate, and it is an example of many similar minerals. The carbonate silicate cycle is a negative CO2 and climate feedback. When it is warmer, there is more moisture in the air. That means more rain, and so more chemical weathering of silicate rock, which consumes atmospheric CO2. This means there is decreased CO2 in the atmosphere, which decreases the greenhouse effect and causes global cooling. Conversely, when it's cooler, there is less moisture in the air. That means less rain and less chemical weathering of silicate rock, and therefore decreased consumption of CO2 by weathering. This allows CO2 to accumulate in the atmosphere from volcanic activity, which increases the greenhouse effect and causes global warming. I included a diagram that goes through the process of the carbonate silicate cycle as a negative feedback loop. Just to reiterate, increasing temperatures leads to increased silicate weathering, which draws down atmospheric CO2 and decreases temperatures, and vice versa. This stabilizes long-term climate on Earth. Emphasis on long-term here. It is thought to be the major control on atmospheric CO2 on million-year timescales but it will not save us from anthropogenic global warming, which is occurring on decades to century timescales. So let's put all the components of the carbon cycle together, the fast carbon cycle and both the organic and inorganic slow carbon cycles. This image does that nicely. I'm not gonna mention the size of the reservoirs, but you can see them listed on each box. The units are in pentagrams of carbon, the cycling of organic carbon between the biosphere or soils and the atmosphere, the burning of fossil fuels and gas exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere all happen on the scale of decades. Thermohaline circulation, also known as the ocean conveyor belt, that describes the movement of water and all the gases it holds in the deep ocean, takes up to a millennium, depending on where the deep water formed. The exchange of carbon between sediments in the deep ocean takes 1,000 to 100,000 years. Then the carbonate silicate cycle takes more than 100,000 years. There are many proposals in existence that would stimulate CO2 drawdown from the atmosphere naturally, 
Proposals range from accelerating natural silicate weathering by fertilizing crops with crushed silicate rocks to enhancing biological carbon export by stimulating oceanic phytoplankton with limiting nutrients. These are examples of geoengineering, which is the deliberate large-scale manipulation of an environmental process that affects the Earth's climate in an attempt to counteract the elements or in, a, in an attempt to counteract the effects of global warming. These are far from the only proposals for geoengineering that are out there, but all proposals of geoengineering require a strong understanding of the Earth's systems and its feedbacks. That concludes this material. Let's go through and review the main points. There's a small leak from the short-term organic carbon cycle. This leak is the preservation and burial of organic carbon in sedimentary rock. Chemical weathering of these organic materials when exposed to oxygen in the atmosphere is the opposite process of burial, and it's the same as respiration. Fossil fuels are a small fraction of that buried organic carbon formed over millions of years. Fossil fuels are thus captured and stored ancient solar energy. Basically, they're like a planetary battery. Humans are now using up fossil fuels unsustainably, increasing CO2 in the atmosphere and transitioning it from the slow carbon cycle to the fast carbon cycle. There are many inorganic forms of carbon that participate in the long-term inorganic carbon cycle. The biggest reservoir is limestone, which is calcium carbonate, also known as chalk. The atmosphere and the ocean exchange gases, including CO2. Acidity is defined on the pH scale and indicates the concentration of hydrogen ions. There are many processes and reservoirs in the inorganic carbon cycle, but the most important are silicate weathering, which consumes atmospheric CO2, and volcanism, which releases CO2 to the atmosphere. The carbonate silicate cycle is a long-term negative climate feedback and acts as a planetary thermostat. There are many carbon cycle processes that involve multiple overlapping timescales. That concludes this material. Thanks for sitting through the lecture. To test your learning, I suggest you review the material and make sure you can answer these questions.